Welcome to Closer to Venus. I'm Johnny Burke. Today's guest is Julia Wesley. She's a teacher, an Akashic Records reader, and a soul blueprint healer. And today we're going to talk about the Akashic Records and what she has learned so far on her journey. Julia, welcome to the program. Hi, thanks so much for having me on. Speaking of the Akashic Records, I know it's a vast topic. For someone who is brand new to this, an absolute beginner, what do they need to know and how should they go about getting a reading? So the easiest way to think about the Akashic Records is that it's sort of just a cosmic library that's out there. Not necessarily a place, I guess you could sort of say it's made out of energy um, because it's non-physical, but it records everything that has happened in the universe. And because time is non-linear, it's a capture of everything that has happened and everything that will happen. Okay, Okay. so everything that will happen, so it does include things that are going to happen in the future. Yeah, it does have a lot to do with timelines. Not everything, it's not like predestination, but because you get to pick and choose what you want your life to be like in every moment, there is an aligned timeline and most likely type line for any given path that you're on. So if you don't like where you're at, you can change it and shift into another timeline. Really? That I've never heard before. It seems like for every possible path, it's almost like a tangent. And if you don't like it, you can just get on to another one. Yeah. So this is actually a good example. Let's use this. You may, when you're attempting to get a reading, stumble across someone on the internet who gives you a reading and it's like a doomsday prediction. And you're like, wow, thanks a lot. I appreciate the knowledge that I'm going to be stabbed and like, six weeks, you know, if you are so out of alignment with this, you're like, I very much don't want to experience this, you can actually go into your record, work with your guides, say, why is this coming up for me? Why would this happen? And you can actually consciously choose to have a different experience. So instead of say, you know, being stabbed that day, maybe you just slept in instead, you don't experience that thing. I like that. Not that I like the idea of getting stabbed, but I like the idea of being able to change it. How did you get started on the path that you're on now? How you got started and you were using meditation and encountered your grandmother or was it a spirit guide or was it both? It was a guide for my grandmother. So what I had done is I had accidentally picked up on intuitive information for my grandmother who was going through something at the time and one of her guides actually gave it to me and then Mm -hmm. I had been in the habit of just brushing off anything sort of spiritual that had happened to me. You know, I I just didn't take it seriously. I guess they had finally gotten fed up with me and I saw him in my mind's eye walk up to me. He flicked me on the floor head. I felt it, which was what freaked me out. And then he just sort of walked away in a huff. And that was what motivated me to start taking this seriously and to consciously work with this. That's incredible. So you encountered a spirit guide. You actually saw him or was it in your mind's eye or how did that happen? It was in my mind's eye. I could Mm -hmm. see him very clearly. But after he flicked me on the forehead, I actually opened my eyes. And the way that I see spirit physically Mm -hmm. is I see it as sort of pinpricks of light. I I call it really concentrated forms of consciousness. And so it sort of looks like a sparkle, but looking at it, you can tell it's full of power, you know, life force. So that's what it looks like to me. As you began to be attuned to that world, that dimension, if you will, did you have any kind of experience with angelic numbers or things like that? Or was it just straight into the spirit guide world? Yeah, it actually had a a bit of a lead up. I had a lot of angel numbers appear to me and throughout Mm -hmm. my life. And I still do. It's still a way that my guides communicate with me. But yes, angel numbers, very much so. Synchronicities. Four, five, five, five. A friend of mine was over here and she looked at the clock on the microwave and she said, why do I keep seeing those kind of numbers? I turned around, it was 333. And with the sprouts today, and there was some kind of sound, something was 555. I was doing some recording the other night, and I stopped it, and it was at 44 seconds of 0.44. I thought, okay, I I, I think I get the picture here, guys. Thanks. That's an extremely cool thing when we start talking about spirit guides, is accessing the records the best way to contact our spirit guides, or maybe is it the only method? I wouldn't necessarily say it's the only method or necessarily the best. It depends on what's easiest for you. So for me, I was unconsciously working in the Akashic Records all the time. And I didn't really realize it until a lot further down the road. A lot of people don't really bother with the Akashic Records. And that's totally fine. A lot of people are just like straight up mediums where they connect into your past loved ones. And they work through that connection rather than going straight into the Akash. You don't have to. 
Since you brought it up, mediums, right? What's the difference between an Akashic Records reading and a mediumship reading? Or do you do both? I actually use my mediumship to access the Akashic Records. Okay. However, when you're doing a mediumship reading, typically what you're looking for is, hey, my aunt died. I would really like to reconnect with her just to make sure she's okay, make sure mm-hmm. that this issue I'm going through with the family, if she has any insight into that, what does she think about the flowers at her funeral, that type of thing. When you're going into an Akashic Records reading, typically you're looking for information on the creation of your soul or other Akashic Records readers do this. I don't, but they'll tell you about a parallel life that's happening. When I give an Akashic Records reading, what I'm focusing on is making sure that we disconnect from other parallel lives that are going on right now so you can focus on your current life because that's where your power is. Parallel lives. Yet another tangent, which is actually (laughs) a pretty cool concept. What do we need to know about parallel lives and as you just described, disconnecting with them. Yes. So the first thing to realize is that time is nonlinear. So Mm -hmm. when you're coming from a soul perspective, your higher self, your God self, however you want to think about it, the part of you that isn't identity or personality, time is not a thing. Time's just a construct that we use in physicality to measure distance, for lack of Mm -hmm. a better term. So it's all relative. I mean, time is different in Australia than it is in the States, right? So it's right. it's all different. So once we get rid of the concept of time as we don't need it, you can sort of get with the idea that everything is happening in the now. And okay. when you understand that everything's happening all at the same time, for lack of a better term, then there really isn't a progression of lives so much as your soul is having an infinite number of experiences all at once. So any life that you may be picking up on that you would identify as one of yours, it's actually a completely separate experience that your soul is having. So you could call it a parallel life, or I call them concurrent lives. They're not yours. They're not you. It's just another experience, another character your soul is playing. And I've heard that expression as well. Regarding the parallel lives, when someone tells you that I have dreams of certain places and certain people, and it's not from a thousand years ago or even like a hundred years ago, it seems to be in this current time. So it's conflicting with my timeline, but I've never been to that place. I've never physically met these people, but they're all very familiar. Is that an example of a parallel life? Or is that just drinking too much wine the night before or whatever that might be? (laughs) No, it very much could be a parallel life. It could be. I mean, at this particular time in history, your soul could be experiencing this time from a handful of different other perspectives. So it's possible. I don't typically run into that, but it's totally something that can be done. And if you're picking up on that in a dream, typically there's something in one of those other experiences that is being shadowed or reflected in your life right now. That's probably why you guys are resonating and tuning into the same frequency there. And as we speak, I just happen to look at my clock and it's 2.22 p.m. (laughs) (laughs) Just saying... Very interesting stuff. And I think the records in particular is probably one of the um, lesser known phenomena. It's a mystery. So when someone contacts you and says, okay, I, I want a reading, what's the difference between accessing the records and having a reading done for you? So I think the difference is intention. Normally, if someone were to come to me and they say, hey, I want an Akashic Records reading, they're doing it for a specific reason of healing, typically. They may not be aware of it, but that's what happens. Mm -hmm. So their guides may have nudged them in my direction because they know that I can help stop identifying with a trauma that they're hooking into in a past life and recreating in this life. But typically, you can actually go into the Akash for just information, like the giant encyclopedia for creation. You can go into it for so many other different reasons than just the work that I specifically do. Okay, so for someone who um, doesn't know how to meditate, can't Mm -hmm. concentrate, how would you advise them to actually access the records or do they need to come to someone like you or a medium for that matter to actually get that done? Yeah, so if you're starting from zero, it may be helpful to first access 
uh, a medium or someone like me who is trained in the Akash because we have all our previous training and practice to lean on to get that information. If you just sort of dive into spirit and all the information that's out there and you haven't really learned discernment, what's useful information, what's just someone who's proselytizing, whatever their Mm -hmm. message is, it may not necessarily be aligned with your highest good. I would caution against that right out of the gate. If you're looking for ways to meditate in like an alternative kind of a way, what I would recommend is a walking meditation or doing something like coloring. Or I actually know someone who gets into a meditative state while they clean their bathroom. So it doesn't have to be you're sitting down, you're blanking your mind and you're trying to meld into the unknown. It just means being present with yourself and bringing all of your conscious attention to where you are in this now moment. So whether that looks like you're going going for a run with your dog, or maybe you're in corpse pose and yoga, whatever works. And through meditation or being in a meditative state, typically, if you do it long enough, your guides will start knocking on your door. They may give you angel numbers. You may have animals come across your path quite often. Maybe you'll see a hawk or maybe you'll have foxes come up to your door. And that is sort of a method of synchronicity and communication from the universe and from your guides. And the more that you tune into what's coming easiest for you and quickest for you is going to be your path of least resistance, so to say. So start where you are, do what's coming easiest for you. And then if the Akash is your ultimate goal and you start building that relationship with your guides, you start learning discernment, you start growing spiritually within yourself, then I recommend at that point towing into the Akash because it's a vast amount of knowledge. And if you don't have a kind of direction, you'll sort of flounder. That would make a lot of sense. And when you talk about discernment, I spoke to someone recently about this and he said before meditating, he says it's very, very important to ask for protection. Otherwise, opening up your antenna, you might have some unwelcome entities. Do you agree? That's an interesting thought. That's one way of doing it. Typically, if you're brand new at this, and let's say you're coming from a kind of low place emotionally, Mm -hmm. and the very first thing you do in meditation is go straight up to your upper chakras, your upper energy centers, and try to connect in with the universe and talk to aliens or whatnot. There's this concept of like attracts like. So if you're coming from sort of a scared or depressed or anxious state, and you're trying to, you're putting your radio signal out to connect Mm -hmm. to something that's non-physical, that's exactly what you're going to get back. You may get lucky and pick up on an angel who's running interference for you, or you could pick up on someone who really has got no business giving advice to anyone. You could pick up on an earthbound, you know, Joe Blow who just doesn't want to move on to the other (laughs) side yet. That's really common. And so when you're working, you know, on discernment, you're getting into meditation, I actually recommend first is people focus on connecting with themselves rather than connecting with literally anything else, because you're going to activate the wisdom of your body when you're using discernment. Something will feel good, something won't feel good. And if you're in the state of always not feeling good in your body, meditation will help you work through why you don't feel good to get to a space of at least neutrality, Mm -hmm. so that if you do access, you know, the the ethers in your meditation and you come across something that you're like, oh, I don't know about that. That was some information that kind of freaked me out. You'll be able to tune into what feels good, what doesn't feel good, or even what doesn't even sound good to you. And you'll be able to discard that and move Mm -hmm. on to something that is more helpful and constructive. With accessing the Akash, it begins to remind me of what uh, I think Dr. Michael Newton described as a lives between lives space where once people pass over, they go into that space in between lives where they judge themselves and they make their soul agreements and How is the Akash different from that or are they related? I love this question because I actually just had a between lives regression session. So yeah, it very much is you are really working in the Akashic records when you do that information. You're picking up on other timelines, the information of other lives that are happening. I think it's very much aligned. It very much is very similar work just done in a sort of different way. One is through hypnosis. I hypnotize you and Mm -hmm. I take you through the process of pulling all the information. So it's a lot of labor on your part. And when someone like me goes into the Akashic Records and I pull the information, it's it's me doing the work and then I'm relaying the information to you. The difference, I would say, in the between the lives between lives therapy, from what I know about it, I don't know if this is the official statement on it, those lives they're not you, right? So it still sort of really involves this idea of karma to an extent, which I personally in my work, we don't need karma. So I do my best to relieve you of it and make sure you're not picking it up from other lifetimes. 
So when the lies between lives therapy, you're going through a past life, quote unquote, to get to the death experience so that you can move into what it's like when you're just a soul and not embodied. So I think it's fascinating work. I think the information that you get from the live between lives therapy session is just fascinating. And that's how we have a lot of our knowledge. But I think that as we continue to do this work, our understanding of what the work actually is will evolve and grow. So for someone who is very interested in this type of thing, they want to, let's say, just for kicks, they want to know who they were in a past life. But they also have some other issues, relationship issues that they'd want to get some answers for. And they want to make sure that there are some soul contracts, perhaps, in a past life or two that might be holding them back. Is the quicker way to get from point A to B, would you say, is to have a regression therapy and then a lives between lives therapy or a reading or a combination? of one of the two or three? Yeah, it could be a combination. I would say in my work, contracts from other lives have literally nothing to do with you. You don't need to be picking them up. If you're picking up on them, it's because there is some sort of pain in your life that is karmically magnetizing the pain in a different life. So let's say, for example, in this life, you're going through something. For some reason, your car keeps breaking down. And you're like, this has happened so many times, it has got to be karma. Why can't I move forward in my life? Why am I trapped? What's happening? Why can I not leave my house? Why can I not go further than two towns over? And so if you start thinking that this is the universe working against me, what is the reason for this? And you reach out into the ethers and you say, oh, it's because I have a contract from my past life that I was going to be responsible for a town or a city or the care and keeping of it. And I could never leave my post. Mm -hmm. And this is my duty and yada, yada. And so I can't move forward in my life. That's karma. You don't need that. That's useless to you in this lifetime. That's not the experience that you're having. You're just trying to get to the grocery store. So it's not doing you any good. So I would say in my work, we're going to unidentify with that other life. We're going to heal the pain this life. Maybe your car keeps breaking down because you're not taking care of yourself or maybe you're not taking care of your finances or your life or maybe you just think you're run down so your car is run down. Maybe it's a different type of issue. Mm -hmm. And so we would heal that instead of reaching into the ethers to find some sort of metaphysical otherworldly reason as to why your car keeps breaking down. So it could be a multitude of things. From a personal perspective, it may actually benefit someone to go through the I have past lives experience just for a frame of reference. So it's so specific that I can't really give you a definitive answer on it. Well, that's a very good answer because it is so specific because everybody's situation is different. Someone recently told me that I had 31 past lives. And I said, I can't remember one of them. I barely remember all of this life, you know. <laughs> it seems like karma is almost like the noise outside our window where we can choose to basically cut it off, whether it's putting up soundproofing or using an, an EQ filter to basically just screen it right out. Is that a, a useful analogy or is it a little bit more complicated than that? Yeah, I think it's a really useful analogy. I think karma becomes yours when instead of recognizing it as noise, you start thinking, I am that car backfiring. And then you start having problems that compound any issue that may have helped you identify with that problem in the first place. So if we're looking to get rid of karma, we can just unidentify. It's just happening outside of me. And I don't need to pick up on it because if it's mine, it would be happening inside of me. Your answers are actually like so good. Usually you have to really kind of dig and dig to get to the, uh, the core of the problem or the issue. It sounds like you've really done your homework and it seems like you've had many mentors. Knowing what you know now about the Akash, especially about lives between lives, which I think is really one of the most important pieces in the whole metaphysical, spiritual realm of things. What kind of impact has your experience with the Akash and everything related to it? Has that changed your viewpoint on religion at all? Or is that neither here nor there? It has. In my work in the Akash, I see religion as a tool. What is the tool that you are using to express yourself in this lifetime? Some people are really into Islam. Some people love Buddhism. Some people mm -hmm. are into Jesus, you know, and it's all great. Those are all tools. The problem, I think, is when you start to identify with the tool instead of mm -hmm. realizing that you're using the tool to expand in some way. You know, maybe you're really focused on surrender and obedience, or maybe you're really working on compassion and presence, or maybe you're really working on brotherly love or something. And that is just the religion and the tool that you're using to express that. 
I would actually say that my work as a medium is what helped me come to terms with religion the most because through my work and through all of my training and the readings that I have given, people's death experience varies depending on what their belief of the afterlife is like. So the personality, once the soul stops identifying as the personality decides to get rid of it, sometimes that little bit that's left over, the, the leftover energy in the car, so to say, you know, it's running, the gas is on, but you've hopped out really quick. Sometimes it will create this idea of like a hell realm or, or a heaven. So people who have had those near-death experiences a lot of the times what happens is they're still sort of connected to their body, right? Energetically, there's still energy there. They still have that belief. They still have their personality. They're still attached to that a little bit because they haven't fully disconnected. And so they need to see Jesus, right? They're dead. Jesus should be here. My family should be here. The angels should be here. I should be, I should be heralded by a choir of angels. And so some people have that like really beautiful, mystical Christian experience where then they are then ushered into heaven. Or sometimes people are really afraid of judgment and they think that they've lived a terrible life. And this is much rarer in the near death experience. But you know, once in a blue moon, you'll have someone be like, I had a I went to a hell dimension and I've turned my life around. And that was part of the experience that maybe subconsciously they expected to have. And so it's it's really interesting. So realizing that everyone's experience was slightly different, even when you're a medium, sometimes if you're picking up on someone who really disapproved of of mediums when they were embodied or alive, they really won't want to talk to you because it would be out of character for them. Not all the time, because a lot of the times the opinion changes once you've crossed over, so to say. But every once in a while, you'll get someone who was like a, a staunch Christian or a Catholic or, you know, staunch anything, and they won't want to talk to you. And that will actually, even that act as a calling card to someone who is looking to connect in with that past loved one. And they'll, and they'll be like, they're not really that interested in talking to me. Did they not approve of this when they were alive? And they'll be like, oh my God, that's mm -hmm. so my grandma, you know, so... Interesting. So it seems like they took that personality with them and that left an impression. I live here in South Florida where there's a definite conservative element, if mm -hmm. you will. And I know friends that go to one of the super churches here and we talk about things like this because they're constantly asking me, what are you doing? What are you reading? And things like that. And whenever I start to talk about the things we're talking about now in mediumship, past lives, you know, near death survivors, they kind of shut down. And I often hear, well, oh, that's not in the Bible. Oh, that's, that's not in the Bible either. And it gets, <laughs> it gets a little frustrating. So can we assume that the afterlife seeing people, friends and family that have passed and so on, you believe that's real. That's not our imagination. No, it's not, it's not your imagination. What the soul does when it's done pretending to be you, right? Is it moves on. It lets go of this personality. It realizes itself as more than just Johnny or Julia right? When you work with a medium and you're like, I want to talk to my Aunt Sue, what the soul will do is it will sort of recreate the experience and energy of Aunt Sue so that you can talk to her. This is actually super, super helpful from a soul perspective and in terms of waking other people up because it's not that your Aunt Sue has ever gone anywhere. It's just that your Aunt Sue was a lot more than you expected. But if we want to talk to Aunt Sue, we'll call up Aunt Sue and we'll rehash our relationship and help you realize that there is more to life than the physical. So let's say one of your Christian conservative friends is really going through a hard time, really grief is a, yeah. is a great way to open people up, not an enjoyable way, but mm -hmm. it's a pretty reliable way to open people up. And they're like, I have to talk to my grandpa or I have to talk to my dad. I need that support. Sometimes our past loved ones will come to us in dreams or they may get desperate and they'll reach out to a medium. And if they have a heart aligned medium, someone who's really looking to help someone, that medium will pick up on their past loved one, give them information that is so specific to them. And it will help open up their mind that there's something more out there that I'm just not paying attention to. And also will give them that peace of mind that my loved ones are safe. My loved ones didn't go to hell. They're not being punished. By the way, there's no such thing as eternal damnation. So just to relieve everyone. I thought the same thing. And I've yeah. been told, do myself a favor and disavow any belief in hell or eternal damnation. This is not going to do me any good anyway. <laughs> That's like telling a girl that I really like, oh, by the way, when you come over for dinner tomorrow night, Bring this like really hot guy with you just so I can make myself miserable, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's self-defeating, yeah. It's almost the same thing because that would be hell for me. 
Regarding mediums, if someone wants to reach out to a loved one or a friend that passed, do you recommend that you have to tell them their names or if they're the real thing, they should be able to figure out, hey, someone is trying to contact me. His or her name is this. How would you suggest we go about that? Actually, as a medium, it's helpful to get a name because it helps me tune in to the frequency of the person you're looking for. If you give me the identity of someone, then I can be like, oh, this is what this person feels like. I can sort of seek them out. Sometimes, though, when you've shown up for a reading, the person that you're looking to speak with is already there, has been speaking with the medium already, has been giving them little nudges beforehand to get them ready. Although I would caution you against putting too much credence in a name, what would give you the most satisfaction is feeling as if the person is there. So they're going to pick up on characteristics of someone, maybe how someone died, maybe what their likes were, their dislikes were, maybe they'll bring up a certain moment that you two shared together that Mm -hmm. was really impactful for both of you, or you guys really liked bees, you had bees in common, maybe you're both beekeepers, you know, or maybe you really laughed over an episode of Seinfeld that one time and had an inside joke about it for years. It's that kind of a thing that makes more of an impact rather than getting someone's name, right? Because at that point, if we're really hinging it on a name, I can Google your name. So it's useful to have the name. But what's most important, what was this person? What were they like? Who were they to you? I wondered, is this advisable to tell someone your loved one or your friend's name, or do you not really need to do that? Mm -hmm. But when it comes to these things, I have no experience. Like a lot of us, we're kind of afraid to ask questions because they might sound dumb, but I think it's really important to know. Karma, you're saying we don't need it. So is it a matter of just unidentifying with it, or does it go a little bit deeper than that? It is a process of unidentifying with it. And so this is an extreme example, but I like this one. So Saddam Hussein Mm -hmm. believed that he was a reincarnation of Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar believed he was the reincarnation of Nimrod from the Bible. So this isn't the evolution of a soul. You're actually witnessing the evolution of karma. So because Saddam Hussein identified as Nebuchadnezzar, who was not a hero necessarily. Not really. (laughs) He could have compounded his problems, been the terrible person he ended up being, if he had not taken on that karma, if he had not worked so hard to become Nebuchadnezzar and to see himself as someone who was just trying to progress that work. Maybe he had a different blueprint. Maybe he was supposed to be a great leader for his people. Maybe it wasn't supposed to be so twisted. That's the problem with karma. So when you pick up on identities of other lifetimes that probably have nothing to do with you whatsoever, in fact, I know they don't, is that you run into the risk of recreating their problems and their pain in your lifetime. That's useless. That's not who you are. That wasn't even who they were or are because it's more of a parallel life sort of a thing. So karma, there's no point to it. If you were to focus on your current lifetime and what you're here to express as you, as Johnny or, you know, as Julia, as me, it's going to be an entirely unique experience And you don't have any debt to make up. You actually create karmic debt when you start trying to borrow from someone else's lifetime. You don't need to do that. A great story about Saddam Hussein, which I obviously did not know. Is it more likely that it was wishful thinking that he was a famous historical figure and pick up on the karma that way? Is that even possible? I'm guessing because I've never read Saddam Hussein and I don't plan to or want to. But Mm -hmm. when things like this happen, when you're reaching out into history for an identity, for validation for what you want to do, to give Mm -hmm. yourself the power and the confidence to do something, that's what happens. That's pain, right? So when you're reaching out into the Akash, the ethers, whatever you want to call it, and Mm -hmm. picking up on another lifetime to give you validation for world domination. This is an extreme example. That's a pain within you. Are you so focused on world domination? (laughs) (laughs) We need to talk about this, you know? That's a character flaw. Yeah, that's a character flaw. It's not because you're Nebuchadnezzar. It's because you're working on something here. And so that's the thing of it. You know, that's karma. It's trying to give reason for your own pain Mm. by trying to validate it with someone else's. And that's compounding a problem. It certainly is. For some reason, I just got the impression that this kind of work could really cut right through all the noise Mm. that maybe conventional therapy cannot. 
It might be a burden for you to admit that, but it seems like you could just cut right to the chase. You can either spend thousands of dollars and get nowhere in therapy, or you can get a reading and say, oh, no wonder you have a problem. It's because of this. You know, again, it depends. It depends on the person. If you're someone who's very open to the idea that mediums are a thing, you can actually access the Akash and you believe in this work and you're ready to let go of everything, we can clear this in one session. That's what I mean. But if you're someone who's not, then therapy is really helpful. Julia, really great stuff. Thanks for joining us. How do our listeners find you online? Yeah, thank you so much. This was great. So you can find me at divinerealignment.com. I do... (laughs) Akashic Records readings. I love to do that. I also do soul blueprint alignments, which we didn't really talk about, but all that information is on my website. You can find me on YouTube. You can find me on Instagram and Facebook, all by the same name, and I'd love to connect with you. Awesome. You've been listening to Closer to Venus. I'm Johnny Burke. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next time.